and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. But we're not talking about bad comics today. Mostly. It's time again for a retrospective. And you know, I get requests for stuff to cover for retrospectives all the time. But the thing about my retrospectives is that I do them on comics that are personally important to me. Especially in how I got to be a comic book reader. This is again one of those cases where I have to remind you all of the old web. Back in the late 90s and early 2000s, the environment for online media was very different. DVDs were still a new invention, and we hadn't quite gotten things down yet for an entire series to be released on home media in a readily available, easy-to-purchase package. Media piracy back then was just as much about trying to see stuff that just wasn't available in any legal format. Even YouTube didn't exist yet. For instance, I watched a fan subbed version of Sailor Stars that I had to download in multiple chunks on real player format in maybe 240p, because basically that was the only way they could host long-form video. The technology just wasn't there yet. Hell, for space-saving reasons on my hard drive, I had to delete most of the episodes I downloaded after watching just so I could be ready for the next files. Out of curiosity, I did check and see if I still had some of them, and indeed I do. They were like 18 megabytes per file, downloaded in October of the year 2000. The old web was wild, my friends. Anyway, where I'm going with this is that I did not have access to the original Generation 1 Transformer series, and I didn't know where to pirate them from. The show was before my time, starting a few years before I was born. I grew up in the 90s with Beast Wars and Beast Machines, and regardless of your feelings about either series, they spoke of the events of the G1 Transformers with reverence, calling it The Great War, and the presence of anything related to the old show was full of intrigue and mystery and just this wonderful sense of awe at what the show was like. Probably would have had a different reaction if I knew about the time Blitzwing tried to recruit a football coach in an attempt to take over over the Decepticons. And as a kid who wanted to learn more about this stuff, to see the Great War in action, there was nothing I could really do about it. I got lucky and saw a handful of episodes, got the movie, but beyond that, nothing. However, one day while surfing various parts of the web, I came across a website that housed scans of every single Marvel Generation 1 Transformers issue. These comics are the Transformers story in their purest, rawest form, aside from the little tech spec blurbs on the back of the toys. Marvel Comics is basically responsible for everything about this franchise. Let's back up a bit and explain how we got here. In 1983, toy manufacturer Takara had a number of different toy lines revolving around transformation. Hasbro liked them and bought the rights to create the toys in America, and united these lines all under the moniker The Transformers. Hence why the franchise simultaneously has robots that change into jets and trucks, while also having ones that shrink down into cassette players and microscopes. And a UFO. Earlier, when Hasbro was trying to revitalize the G.I. Joe toy line, which up to that point was mostly known for being about generic military figures, they had tapped Marvel to create an entire new setting and concept for the toys, resulting in the franchise pretty much as it's known today. Real American Hero, Cobra, etc. And thus Marvel was brought in to do the same with the Transformers, with Jim Shooter and Dennis O'Neill coming up with the overall concept, while Bob Budiansky would create a lot of the names of the characters. And since G.I. Joe had had a successful comic line, why not give one for Transformers as well? And it technically predated the original TV show. Sure, in development at the same time, but this got released first. Now, I need to make it clear here, this retrospective is only concerned with the US series. Nothing against fans of the UK issues, but one, my retrospectives are on the stuff that informed me as a comic book fan, and it was the US issues that were relevant, and two, I'm already covering 40 comics today. I'd rather not do 166 if I can avoid it. So how did things start off for these robots in disguise? Is this series still as endearing and engrossing for me as a bitter, cynical adult as it was when I was a naive, optimistic teenager? Well, let's dig into Marvel's The Transformers number 1 to 40 and roll out and one shall stand and light our darkest hour. And you've got the touch and I think you've got the idea.
naturally, this will be a lot of summarizing with little to no discussions of dialogue. Well, maybe when we get to Simon Furman stuff, but that's a long ways off. Bob Budiansky was the main writer of the book for most of its run, but the first four issues were split between Bill Mantelo and Jim Salakrup. Bill doing the first two and Jim handling issues three and four. Because, you know, 40 comics, not gonna look at a lot of the covers. But some of these have become iconic in their own right, and referenced several times over the years. So I'll try to talk about those as we come across them. We begin, of course, with the very first issue, wherein a very chunky, stiff Optimus Prime is crushing a Decepticon in one of his fists, attached to his very stubby arms. One shall stand, one shall fall! Also, gotta love the giant heads of young Hal Holbrook and Haley Joel Osment in the back there. Who are you? I'm Ray. Ray who? Ray Transformers. And as you can see on top, this is number one in a four-issue limited series. Yeah, truth be told, it's just these four single comics that I'm doing a retrospective on. Somehow, I'll fit them into three episodes. Circling the star Alpha Centauri ages ago was a planet unlike any other in the heavens. Everything's on a cob! The whole planet's on a cob! Go! Go! Cybertron. No rock or soil or sand contributed to its bizarre geography. Its content was entirely mechanical. Eat it, geology! My planet is made of robots! Joking aside, the narrator does acknowledge that the planet, about the size of Saturn, has origins that are long since forgotten, so it's likely it's not a natural phenomenon. I mean, why a planet would just form with mechanisms is improbable to the point of impossibility, but suspension of disbelief and all. Anyway, robotic life evolved on it. The Autobots. And everything was peaceful and prosperous, and there were no wars or traffic accidents. And then the Decepticons showed up, led by Megatron. Some really fun early installment weirdness here is that aside from Soundwave, the microcassette Ravage is also there. And he talks. Yes, as we've seen a handful of times on this show, while in the cartoon it was only really Rumble and Frenzy who talked from Soundwave's Legion, in the comics they pretty much all talked. And do more than that, as we'll see. Just another piece of evidence of how Soundwave superior... Megatron says their deal is that peace has brought stagnation to Cybertron, and during the centuries they've been gathering their forces and readying an arsenal. Even the transformation process itself is so that they can become more powerful weapons. And apparently the war that followed was so bad that Cybertron itself was flung from its orbit. It's gonna turn out that this isn't Alpha Centauri, but the SETI Alpha system, and their war is what screwed over Khan and Star Trek. Don't tell me it couldn't happen! Star Trek and Transformers are totally in the same continuity. Reviewed that one last year. Soon, we Decepticons will have ground our enemies under our heel, and we shall begin our prime task. Rebuilding Cybertron into a cosmic dreadnought! We shall turn our very planet into the single most deadly weapon in existence! It shall become some kind of... Death Star or something! Ravage! Start working on a name for it! To counter Megatron, a new leader of the Autobots arose, Optimus Prime, who apparently used to be a massive combat vehicle. For over a thousand years, the war raged. Eventually, Cybertron's flight through space put it directly on course for a dense asteroid belt that would annihilate the planet when they reached it. As such, Optimus volunteered to lead an expedition to clear a path through it, despite the risk of the Decepticons attacking their exposed ship, the Ark. Ravage overhears all this and informs Megatron. See that you never waver, Master of Stealth. All too often, the nature of the spy is to weigh his loyalties and switch when he feels the time is right. Eh, definitely worked for him when he showed up in Beast Wars. The Autobots are successful, but the Decepticons launch their attack on the Ark. With their resources drained from clearing the asteroid, the Decepticons make short work of their forces. Fortunately, Optimus anticipated this possibility, so he made sure the ship was pre-programmed with an alternate path to ensure that they and the ship never fall into Decepticon hands, sending them on a suicide run at a planet nearby, Earth. However, instead of blowing up on impact, they crash land inside of a dormant volcano. That wakes up four million years later in 1984. I knew it! Big Brother is Megatron! The volcanic blast accidentally reactivates some of the Ark systems, in particular a probe that gets sent out to gather data back to the Ark. Since the Transformers weren't really used to organic life, the probe doesn't really detect carbon-based life forms as life, and only detects sophisticated machinery like jets as indigenous life to Earth. 
After learning about various devices and vehicles, the probe returns to the Ark and begins reviving everyone in the craft. The ship's systems were damaged and thus cannot distinguish friend or foe, reviving the Autobots and Decepticons simultaneously and augmenting them so they'll transform into the machines of Earth to help the robots survive. You'd think they'd immediately start fighting each other again, but after a roll call on the Decepticon side, including the three jets Skywarp Thundercracker Starscream, of course his awesomeness Soundwave with tapes Buzzsaw, Laserbeak, Rumble, Frenzy, and Ravage, Megatron elects for them to flee. Thing is, they're few in number and don't have many resources. If their attack on the Autobots should fail, they're screwed. Best to regroup elsewhere and figure out the situation. On the Autobot side, we've got Ironhide, Huffer, Bumblebee, Sunstreaker, Cliffjumper, Brawn, Sideswipe, Mirage, Blue Streak, Prowl, Jazz, Hound, Wind Charger, Gears, Ratchet, Wheeljack, and Trailbreaker. And most of those names you could just forget about because they're not going to be important for 80 issues! Yeah, I do wonder what the logic was in just having so many characters. Maybe it was just the insistence of having the entire toy line represented, which is not helped when we start introducing more and more Transformers into the mix. Optimus acknowledges that after 4 million years, Cybertron may not even exist anymore, so their priority for the time being is to safeguard this world, especially all the life on it, from the threat the Decepticons pose. It's here where we're introduced to our first recurring human characters, Buster and his father, Sparkplug Witwicky. Of course, in the cartoon, he was known as Spike, but it's a little more complicated. Complicated. See, there were three names being considered for this character early in production. Buster, Spike, and Butch. According to Jim Shooter, they had settled on Spike, but the cartoon producers thought the name was too aggressive, so they went with Buster. And then the cartoon went and used Spike anyway. They'd later just explain that Spike is Buster's brother who's away at college. In the meantime, Sparkplug is a mechanic who's upset that his son is wasting all his daggun time doing something as pointless as reading and trying to get a scholarship to college. Why can't he do something more useful and fix cars? Still, he's not gonna force him to do anything he doesn't want to. He's just worried about his career aspects in the future and all. He lets his son take the car out to a drive-in theater with his friends, and what a dink! That's where an Autobot scouting party soon finds a bunch of cars and wants to make contact. The Decepticons, spotting them, don't want them to forge an alliance with the people of Earth, especially since the planet is rich in fuel resources, and thus they attack. In the ensuing fight, or just because he's really clumsy, Bumblebee gets damaged. Buster gets into him and drives away to safety as the other Autobots soon realize that the humans fleeing the battle are, in fact, the inhabitants of Earth. Buster brings Bumblebee back to his dad's garage, who's at first ecstatic that his son is taking an interest in mechanical stuff, until he tells him how Bumblebee is alive. Help me, please! I'm dying! This is a weird remake of Herbie the Love Bug. Issue 2 begins with the Decepticons realizing the humans are indeed the dominant life form on Earth, but also setting up the Megatron and Starscream dynamic. Starscream is much sneakier about his attempts to undermine Megatron's authority. Megatron, for instance, is very much a brute force, full frontal attack sort, while Starscream prefers being cautious, scout things out and get as much information as possible first. Megatron knows that Starscream is attempting to usurp him, but knows that he has good ideas too, so he's not just going to disregard anything he says. And Anyway, they launch an attack on a nuclear plant under construction and pilfer it for technology and resources. Meanwhile, Sparkplug is disbelieving Buster's story, but does repair Bumblebee enough to the point where he's able to transform and confirm what's up. Eventually, they make contact with Optimus and offer to figure out a way to convert standard gasoline into something the Autobots can use. And indeed, Optimus and the other Autobots show up at the garage. Those cars don't have any drivers in them, Mitchell! Ah, uh, Sparky probably developed some kind of remote control device, Doris. You know, like that one kid we heard about who built one into a silver dollar. Come to think of it, I think that's his truck out there. The Decepticons, however, learned about this thanks to Ravage and Attack, getting away with Sparkplug as their prisoner so he can convert fuel for them instead. The Autobots want to pursue, but they're low on fuel and collapse. Man, the Autobots are in a tight spot. It's a shame this isn't canon to the Marvel Universe like Rom was, or else a superhero like Spider-Man could show up. Anyway, in issue 3, Spider-Man shows up. 
Yeah, I've mentioned this before, and it was especially relevant to the ROM perspective. Marvel had this tendency to make their licensed tie-in comics canon to the Marvel Universe. They evidently had the same idea for the Transformers, and issue 3 is stuffed full of references to the larger Marvel Universe. And honestly, connecting them did make sense when this was just a four-issue miniseries. The problem is that there comes a point where the story grows so big that it becomes untenable for both to exist at once. After all, where was Optimus Prime during Secret Wars? Why weren't the Avengers actively trying to stop the Decepticons as they grew more powerful? It just doesn't really work. Rom got away with it because the Dire Wraiths were acting in secret, and most of Rom's interactions with humans for a good chunk of his series were with the normal residents of a single town or a few lesser-known heroes. The Autobot and Decepticon war on Earth is not the kind of thing that the larger Marvel Universe could be ignoring, and Cybertron drifting through space for four million years would have undoubtedly run across more alien races from the Marvel Universe that would cause issues. Maybe you can make it work if you planned it out in advance and really put a lot of thought into how you could incorporate the two things together, but this was the mid-80s. Event comics weren't even really a thing yet. Secret Wars was still going on at the time, so big planning on incorporating this book and its future into the Marvel Universe was just not in the cards. Although it's amusing that Hasbro didn't even want Spider-Man in this book, Marvel was the one pushing it. Hasbro disagreed because Spidey's toy rights were tied up with Mattel at the time. They compromised by having Spidey appear here in the black symbiote costume, since it was the regular Spider-Man outfit that Mattel was selling at the time. And of course, the rights issues with this caused more problems down the line. This IDW trade that reprinted the first 16 Marvel Transformers books had to omit issue 3 and just summarize what happened in the issue, even repainting him on the cover so it was just a solid black outfit. Which is kind of ironic because Spidey did once wear an all-black costume and called himself Dusk. Anyway, Sparkplug is brought to the Decepticons' fortress, constructed out of the dismantled nuclear plant, a fact that Sparkplug has deduced and realizes just how little the Decepticons understand Earth's primitive technology. He tries to just give name, rank, and serial number, as he once had to as a POW in the Korean War, but Megatron just threatens to kill him if he doesn't cooperate. Meanwhile, the Autobots have to withdraw to the Ark to try to refuel, as crowds and police have now seen the battle between the two robot forces. Well, hey, why don't they ask Ulysses Solomon Archer back there to help? I'm sure he could whip up something just as good, if not better, than Sparkplug. And yeah, that is a legit cameo by US-1 back there. This was printed around its... 10th or 11th issue, if I'm not mistaken. And now I just want a US-1 and Transformers crossover. Why not? They're crossing over with everything else nowadays. Sparkplug finally agrees to help and has the Decepticons acquire a bunch of stuff for him to help build the converter. The government soon takes notice of them and the giant fortress the Decepticons have built. The army and reporters soon traveling to the scene. S.H.I.E.L.D. even sees this. We gotta check out what's going on in Oregon, Nicholas. Dum-dum, if that big green fire-snorting lizard is loose again, I quit. Oh yeah, another licensed book thrown in there. S.H.I.E.L.D. dealt with Godzilla once. Dr. Linksano made a video about those comics a few years ago. Oh my god, why have we not had Transformers vs. Godzilla? Honestly, given these connections, I'm shocked Rom doesn't make a cameo or anything here. Anyway, with reporters at the scene, we of course have Peter Parker, who had apparently ditched the symbiote by this point, so they required an editor's note to say this took place before then. That's especially goofy since, as I said, Secret Wars was still being published at this point, and his costume change had already been undone in the main books. Whoops. This costume's quite a time saver. All I have to do is think about changing, and it takes care of the rest. If only I could solve all my problems as easily. Yeah, like the problem of where the hell you're shooting that web line to, Pete. You're in the middle of a desert with no large trees or anything around. After a brief bit of standard two heroes meeting each other misunderstanding bit with the Autobot Gears, Spidey teams up with our heroes to try to get them clearance through to attack the Decepticons. His brilliant plan? Steal an army man's helmet and drive Huffer through in the lead to make it look like he's in the army and acting under orders to go to the front, making no effort to disguise himself in any other way. This plan actually works! You magnificent bastard, I read your book!
They managed to get Sparkplug out, but it seems he succeeded in building a fuel converter, demonstrated in issue 4 by Megatron stepping outside to confront the army, whose weapons do nothing to him, and he just steps back inside to show how much they don't matter to him. Starscream tries another attempt to undermine Megatron here, but Megatron has finally had enough and blasts him for this. Despite his treasonous tone, Starscream had a point. Ravage, go to the Ark and report back to me on the Autobots' progress. Well, at least he acknowledges my good ideas. Better than my last corporate job. Since we're still in the Marvel Universe at this point, the Autobots learn that their probes did actually detect another Cybertronian on Earth a few million years ago. The Decepticon Shockwave, and he actually took up residence in the Savage Land. And, in fact, the Ark's defensive systems found out Shockwave's presence and constructed five new Autobots to go deal with him based on the life forms in the Savage Land. The Dinobots. This is ridiculous on, like, 50 different levels. One, wasn't the Ark's friend or foe sensors disabled in the crash? How did it know Shockwave was an enemy? Two, why did Shockwave travel all the way to the Savage Land, which is in Antarctica? Even if he was breaking off from Megatron's forces, surely he would have found someplace more suitable. Three, how did the probe determine that the dinosaurs were life forms when before it could only register mechanical objects as life? Four, why did it not just revive the Autobots instead of building five new robots? Five, how did it build five new robots when the Autobots are so low on resources they're hoping a human can convert fossil fuels to them? It just raises too many questions. Oh, but the Ark's automated systems do them one better, because they detect a new signal from Antarctica that it just automatically sends out a probe to excavate the source of the signal, and awakens Shockwave, who comes and blasts both the Autobots and the disabled Decepticons. Yeah, the fuel process Sparkplug came up with actually slowly sabotaged them. Admittedly, we can forgive some of this because this leads us into issue 5's cover, which is one of the best and most remembered of the series. Take a look at that! Bold move for them once the miniseries got upgraded into an ongoing series to just start off by saying, They're all dead! Also, apparently the Transformers logo is diegetic, otherwise Shockwave just randomly burned into a wall, are all dead. And right next to the graffiti that informs us that there was a hole here, but it's gone now. Unlike the loyal servant that Shockwave was on the show, dutifully trying to call Megatron for four million years without success, here Shockwave has decided that Megatron is an inferior leader to him, since he follows pure logic, and thus he's assuming command. There is logic in what he says. We do learn that Shockwave was not on the Ark when everything went down, but rather followed them to Earth. Though that does now raise the question of why he didn't just leave when he couldn't find them. Still, in any case, Megatron bides his time to resume command. Shockwave has reasoned that Optimus Prime contains the Creation Matrix, which instead of being a kind of vague, quasi-mystical force like would later be shown in the movie, the Creation Matrix is instead the method by which its possessor can construct new Transformer life. Which, again, raises even more questions about how the Ark made the Dinobots, but whatever. Shockwave plans to use the Matrix to create a new army of Decepticons to rule Earth. Fortunately, the Autobots have an outside ally. Ratchet wasn't taken with the others due to another subplot, so he and Buster are able to sneak in, though Optimus has been decapitated. Buster Witwicky, you must help me. You are the Autobots. Last hope. Can you scratch my nose? I have been in utter agony for hours. Issue 6 sees Shockwave begin his plans, assaulting a new state-of-the-art oil drilling platform owned by industrialist Tony Stark. I'm um, uh, sorry, I mean GB Blackrock. The platform was developed by this woman, Josie Beller. Naturally, an oil platform has a bunch of automated defense cannons, which are ineffective against him. In the attack, Blackrock tries to get everyone to evacuate, but Josie refuses to leave, and ends up massively electrocuted for her trouble. Speaking of people getting electrocuted, Optimus asks for Buster's help, saying there's no time to explain, to just take the two wires on his forehead and put them on either side of Buster's own head. And he gets zapped. Ho oh, ho, Buster! I forgot to tell you, Shockwave deleted my ethical subroutines. This was just a really funny prank to me. <laughs> Buster? Yeah, I'll tell him again when he wakes up. 